On session four, we talk about infrastructure and logistics. The objective was to explore the infrastructure and logistical aspect of establishing and operating a battery collective. We also recognize that striving for a perfect blueprint can be paralyzing. And while focusing on realistic solution that works today can drive progress. And what we left off for you is a little takeaway question of what are your logistical wants and what are your logistical needs? Because as we shared a few times in our stories, a lot of times when we don't know what's a logistical want versus what's a logistical needs, we end up getting bogged down with a lot of the um, potential things that's going to happen, which we later realize those are ju just logistical wants when we have logistical needs, which is people have power outage right now, even though we don't have major disaster yet. So we felt like a lot of logistical wants were just wanting to prepare for the worst case scenario disaster when we have real logistical needs right now where we have spotty blackouts that happen in our community that we should be addressing now. I'd love to um, take a moment to see if anyone had a chance to sh think about what your logistical wants and what your logistical needs are for your community? I think my logistical want will be having a underground power lines and like a fiber optic. I think that will help. I've been thinking about it for years, but since I'm not in that field, I wish I was. That would help a lot of uh, areas that are prone to have tornadoes and hurricanes. Not that's the first thing when the wind blows. I notice it gets knocked down here faster than when I was in the previous states I used to live in. Yeah, the infrastructure is weak down here in Jackson, um, and they get a lot of rain. Not a lot of rain, but a lot of winds. Even though there's not a lot of tornadoes and stuff. And another lo logistical need I was thinking will be more, uh, more people on the ground that work for the city, the power company. They need to take it seriously because there's families out there that really need these infrastructures. The lower income neighborhoods are the ones that suffer the most the power grid just needs to be very efficient for everyone. Yeah, that's wonderful. And that synthesizes into a lot of times what we want is the toys, the infrastructure, but what we actually need are the people and the people on the ground to make these things happen. Thanks so much for sharing, Anita. Belvin. Okay. I was just going to say that we are in South Shore and we work in a couple of different spaces as far as cooperatives are concerned. Uh, and when it comes to rolling blackouts and things like that, um, we as a neighborhood <clears throat> don't really get the same type of response. Uh, for example, I think it was last, uh, maybe late fall, early winter, and we had two hours of uh, power outage that basically paralyzed our ability to do anything on that particular day without food pantry distribution. Everything had to be done by paper and pencil, paper and pen, as opposed to just logging people in on a computer and having them get their needs met for groceries and other immediate need items. The problem that we have is that we have people that are already underserved uh, in the communities that we are in. And once that shock of a, a infrastructure compromise happens, that just basically brings everything to the brink of, uh, of collapse because people are already living on the margins. So the, the logistical need for us to address is that so people who have 
already experienced a whole lot of shortfalls in their socioeconomic condition, don't have to go through the added stress of a power outage or infrastructure compromise that basically sets them back even more so than where they already are set back from. Thank you, Alvin. Thank you for sharing that. That's why we got us, so we're going to make this happen. So I just want to share with everyone, when we talk about wants and needs, especially like if individuals are doing emergency planning or they're doing uh, planning for a battery co-op or anything, actually. So it's just learning to distinguish a want from a need. A lot of times people use the terms interchangeably, but a need would be water. So if you're thinking about preparedness or whatever you're thinking about, I need water. And it's going to sound funny when I say a want is clean water. So people are like, oh, why is a want clean water? And then you go back to the need, which is the know-how to clean that water. So if you're in a situation where you know you need water, you don't necessarily need clean water. If you get any type of water, that's what you need. And you also need the knowledge to take that water and to purify that water. So it's uh, good to drink. And we learn things as we live, but uh, one of the things is how to, when to boil water or when not to boil water for purification, when straining water is better, when charcoal will work, how to make charcoal, like just different things that can be used in multi facets, but just some food for thought. So when we think about wants and needs, ultimately we're trying to refine down the needs to what the actual need is. And sometimes that's just taking a little bit extra time to think about the layer underneath what we think the obvious is. I am not a first responder and I don't want to be an apologist for them, but I want to lay out some things for everyone to understand what can go on. A large majority of first responders do not live in communities that are affected. So in a crisis, they have to get to where the epicenter of what occurs is. Oftentimes, people do not train in departments for the worst case scenario. Like in the case of Katrina in New Orleans, General Honoré Russell, the black man, he pointed out that one, people did not leave because they did not have money on hand and were waiting for checks. Katrina happened on a Thursday. Vehicles that they wanted to use were not available because they were not on high ground and they got flooded. To be short, understand what these departments do during these particular events so you have an understanding of how to manage your expectation level and be aware that there are things that you can do so that in the event that you don't give FEMA five to seven days because they're driving through things and power lines are falling and people are losing command and control where they're at a joint command center themselves. So understand that we do have a responsibility to do what we're doing now with these batteries so that we can make ourselves safe but also we would benefit from understanding what they do so we can manage our expectation of them. A police officer does certain things which is related to policing. National Guard, state of emergency, that comes from a higher level than the governor. And that's one reason why in Katrina certain things didn't happen because it was a Republican president and a Democratic governor. And the Democratic governor did not want to relinquish power to a Republican president. As we look at moving forward, understand some of these other elements so we have a better understanding and we're not mad and we don't have a different expectation level than we should about what might and might not happen. Thank you, Kelvin. It's always good to think about people who have different roles and what their limitations are so that we can be much more aware of what we can do. We're going to talk about building collective culture and operations. What the main objective we're hoping to achieve is to explore strategies for building an organic and sustainable collective culture within the battery collective that you're going to be starting in order to address governance and operational aspects of things. Uh, these are all very abstract and somewhat amorphous. And today we're going to be shaking you out of your box to help spawn some culture 
we're going to be highlighting collective culture and really help you think about how you can come up with how we relate to each other versus emergency plan. Generally, that will be a solution that is planned out for you. So as we do this emergency battery collab, trying to create a community backup power supply, we really need to think about how do we actually create a collective culture so we can all show up for each other and create solutions that works for all of us. So today we're going to start with a breakout group. It's just basically a question you guys are all going to take into the group. And the groups will be about maybe three or four people per group. I'm just taking a brief look here. And if everyone can take a moment just to write this question down, we're going to talk about in your first group, you guys are going to discuss the three different types of batteries that we talked about, the uh, lead acid, the AMG, and uh, the lithium battery. And you guys are going to imagine that you guys are in a battery collective and you're trying to figure out which battery you guys are going to choose for your group. So <laughs> question is now, were you able to collectively agree on something? Uh, does any group want to, to take the mic and, and go first? Yeah, I think we, we were able to agree on the AGM. Um, and the reason being, even though lithium ion over the long term is probably cheaper, but you have to outlay about three times the price initially. But since we're just starting out with this whole concept of loaning out stuff and possibly some degree of abuse. If lead, if AGM batteries are dropped, they pretty much don't have any problem. But lithium ion batteries, because I work for, I help pedicabbers maintain their batteries. And the pedicab jostles over rough roads and everything. And it, a couple of the lithium batteries got destroyed that way. So to start out, I would, we, we agreed to vote for um, AGM. Mm -hmm. The cheaper lithium ions use what's called a, a thin pouch cell. The contents of the cell is just a very thin aluminized pouch. And those pouches can get deformed in the shape if they are jostled up and down a bunch, like on a, a rough road. If you have one in your car and you're on a dirt road, in Alaska somewhere, it could possibly cause damage in the case where you buy cheaper manufacturer brands, which we were doing for the pedicab, ordering them on eBay from China at a cheaper price, but they didn't last very well under that kind of stress. Yeah. So that's a, a good note there. We didn't go, actually go over that, but if you guys have ever flown on like the airlines, there's a little thing that says, are you carrying lithium batteries or something of that nature? They're actually not allowed in the cargo holding area for that very reason. Um, anyone else would like to share? Our group had an interesting issue with command and control. One of the members, he kept going in and out. So in breaking up, we couldn't necessarily hear what his thoughts were, but we thought that the lithium battery would be one expensive and two it its rating is that it takes a long time to charge and we talked about the agm battery and we talked about how it could be transported and having it at a very inexpensive price would enable us to perhaps lose it not get it back it breaking whatever so we had thought about this AGM battery as well. One thing that we talked about in our group was potentially having an ideal and then a fallback. And so honoring, not wanting to speak for other folks. So one of the, the example that I shared is the, the group that I've been building with. We're trying to have as many lithium because that's what we have experience with, like lithium battery based, like building solar generators. 
at as many as possible within community and then also having smaller lithium batteries with solar panels. But if that breaks, I can't fix a lithium battery and I'm not gonna be able to get one like in the weeks right after a, a bad hurricane. But I will have access some type of way to a car battery, an RV battery, a boat battery. Those are things, even if a tree fell on the car across the street from my house, there might be a battery that we can then hook up, right? Even if I'm not excited about lead acid batteries for all the reasons that they're complicated, I want and need to know how to hook that up as my backup plan, because even if it's not the ideal, it's profoundly more accessible if things go wrong. Thank you, and thank you for sharing that. I like the out of the box thought process there. Thinking back also on what you said earlier, you don't need the water, you need the knowledge on how to do what you can do with the water. So in that kind of thinking, the knowledge and how to work with those batteries that you can find out in the wild, but at the same time, something that we uh, discussed short, briefly was like, if the money is coming from a grant or something, I'm going to get the best thing that I can get that's going to last the longest. <laughs> That'll be cool, too, to have a resource for as long as it can last. It can be inside. There's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of benefits to having a really nice thing, but also the knowledge to be like, yeah, I'm going to go take that little scooter. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. And with that, we're going to move into our second breakout group. So the question is, you guys can collectively think about what uh, is the number one unanswered question from this learning series that you have. Two of the questions fell into the battery itself. So one, when, when can we get a battery? <laughs> if, if we get a battery through this. And then how those batteries might work in inclement weather, specifically in winter storms. Is that something that we need to be concerned about and then my personal question was how do we communicate with people that we have this resource once we get it has anyone thought about we, we're all in this course we're all doing this coursework to to understand like how to build a community how to set up a community how to set up a battery collective has anyone given any thought about how to set up a battery collective yeah i think so i we recently set up a tool library in Lexington, Kentucky, where I live. It's pretty new. People are like confused about what it is or I, I went to a art fair this weekend and I was handing out, I handed out like 250 just like quarter sheet flyers about the tool library and people kept, they, they thought it was too good to be true or didn't quite make sense to them. And I think that the, I think that an emergency battery works could live in the tool library as like an ongoing regular resource that people take advantage of for like parties or like screenings in the park, movie screenings in the park or going camping or whatever they want to use off-grid power for, but then also be available in times of emergency to be distributed equitably. And I think that the hard part is like figuring out what those decision making is going to be like, because we're going to have maybe like 10 batteries or something and maybe 100 people, 200 people know about the tool library and need power. And we're going to figure out how to process those requests or like group people together like we're talking about here. So anyway, I think that my personal feeling is that like a tool library, an equipment library, a library of things is a great home for kind of organizing the the battery collective overall. That's a good idea. Lending, I'll take one from chat. Alice says, one question was, what are the various end of life solutions for the three types and the environmental and human act, uh, impact, toxicity, et cetera? Can they be recycled? So if I'm understanding the question correctly, it's at the end of the life of the battery. You've used a battery 10 years, three years, five years, the battery no longer has charging capabilities. What do we do with the battery? Does anyone know like about lead acid batteries or AGM batteries or, or lithium batteries? What happens toward the end of their life? Eugene. 
Yeah, lead acid batteries and AGM batteries are virtually 80 to 90% recyclable. All of the lead inside, there's, there's an established industry to recycle these kind of batteries for many decades. And when you buy a new battery, you're discounted $20 or 20 to $40 if you return the old battery to the store where you buy the new one and they'll recycle it. They'll ship it off to get recycled. Now, lithium ion, it's made out of cobalt, which is what children are mining in Africa. And it's got some health effects the way it's mined so cheaply with no protection. Um, I just read an article yesterday though that in the laboratory, they're, they're starting to develop recycling methods for lithium ion batteries. It's not widespread on massive scale yet, but hopefully it's something that will, will be in the near future. Our main question was how exactly to make the batteries. We didn't have a clear understanding on how to do that. Um, does anyone have an understanding on how to make the batteries? I think that the question is more about how to make a backup battery, not the actual battery itself. Uh, Anyone um, have any thoughts about that, how to make a backup battery? Or here's a question, the components that you might need to make a backup battery. I was going to answer your question. I think if you watch the video and you show the essentially the three components that go into the milk crate. Alice is absolutely correct. The video, yes, does uh, depict the components that are necessary to make the battery. I think we also shared a flyer on um, the components to make the battery as well. And we'll be diving deeper into that during our office hours. I know a bunch of y'all have already been building with them, but the footprint project, they both come and support with building up solar community support hub pieces and honoring what communities do and don't want being invited in, all these pieces. But they also come in and in our community, they came in and collaborated with local groups and we built solar generators ourselves, right? So they would come with the with all the bits and bobs, right? So there's the inverter. And if we buy that solar panel on market, it's seven or eight grand for what we would use at community hub. All the bits and bobs are like four to five grand. And so we do the few thousand dollars of connecting the wiring and learning, but then that also meant that we learned also how to not just build it, but how to maintain it. And then those solar generators stayed in community. But just as another group to build with. Thank you very much, Ann. Yeah, so one of the things that I will just, I'm going to end with this and then I'm going to pass it on to Kansas is that there are a lot of resources out there, tons of resources. So please hop online, hop on YouTube, just type in there, emergency battery. There'll be a video that shows you how to do everything step-by-step step as well. Um, what those videos miss is the community aspect, is that self-governance aspect, is the aspect of how to build community around that and how to support community around that. It's fun to like hop in your garage and tinker with things. It's even more fun to hop in your garage and tinker knowing that it's going to support your community in a time of need or support yourself or support your family in a time of need. So making those connections is really what this course has been about and will continue to be about. But yes, we pull in those resources as well. We definitely encourage people to go out and get those resources. Thank you so much, everyone. So you might have noticed today was a little bit different. We had a lot more breakout rooms. We weren't just up here presenting something. And this is a big, this is part of the lesson too, and part of the transition that we'll be going through into this office hours part of the series. Instead of us being the experts and giving you all of the knowledge, what we experienced today was collectively coming together with people that you either loosely know or maybe have even communicated with on this course and discuss various problems with some of what we've learned and some with that is personal experience and from where you are and we learned how and practiced what it's like to talk to other people listen to other people and try to synthesize information together 
when we all came back into the breakout rooms, I don't know if you noticed, but we didn't answer any of the questions. We all just pushed them back on to the community and you. And this highlights that communities are built of different strengths. Some people have technical strengths. Some people are good at uh, rallying the community, communicating, understanding command and uh, control, logistics, all of these things. People have different expertise and knowledge. And the only way that we can really tap into them is getting into rooms and really talking about it and discussing the issues. So we emphasize a lot about building this collective culture. We also highlighted this idea of thinking outside the box, if you will, about wants and needs and how they can be addressed and practiced in our communities and in our collectives and our groups. We learned the value of what it's like to maybe not even come to a consensus, right? And have multiple different opinions. And as we go forward, th this is something we're going to be comfortable with and understand how to embrace, but also make pragmatic choices and experiment and test things. So anyway, that's the conclusion from today. So I just want to add real quick. So just take a moment to reflect on the two breakout sessions that you were in with your group to just think about how that conversation went. We're so used to getting into breakout sessions on Zoom. So thinking about how that conversation went, no good or bad, it's all about like, how did the conversation come about? How did you all approach the prompt that was thrown at you? How did it come in when it comes to everyone sharing their thoughts? What kind of space was created to create that? When people having different ideas that you didn't think about or you disagree with, how did you show up? So these are things, of course, a lot of you all are already organizers and facilitators that you are already really well versed with. And we created this space, really just want you to have an opportunity to take notes because a big part of our objective here is exploring strategies to build this organic and sustainable collective culture. So I want you to take a moment to just think about these two and think about what Kansas said and think about what does consensus mean? Doesn't mean it's good, doesn't mean it's bad, but how do you create that space for all of you to bring in what you know and what you can go out and look for on the internet and bring to the group. I'll hand it back to you, Kansas. Just want to add that, emphasize the great points that you made. <laughs> no, thank you. I think that's honestly basically it.